Okay. This is going to be a, a, a different kind of talk than the ones you've heard because like Sarah, I'm presenting results from an agent-based model. But unlike her, it's not a mature model where we have a lot of results, although this is the very first place where I'm presenting any results from our model. This is a model that we have specially developed for one particular disease, MRSA, which I'll talk a bit about, and, what, and it is just emerging from its gestational period. So there's going to be a bit about the development of the model in here as well. So my outline, I'm going to talk about what community MRSA is and then discuss some of the unknowns about transmission dynamics and why we want to know them because how they will relate to different kinds of control measures. Then I'm going to give you an overview of this agent-based model that we are just finishing the initial steps of developing. And then our preliminary results are reproduction numbers which have been beautifully set up by this morning's talks and the implications for policy. So MRSA is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So to start with, Staphylococcus aureus um, is a bacteria that commonly hangs out on people's bodies. A high proportion of the population, 20% or more, are, are colonized usually with staph, often in the nose, on the skin, and it does them no harm whatsoever. It just hangs out there. But it can cause a broad spectrum of infections, some of which are very serious. It can infect the skin, but it can also infect the blood, the brain, the bones, and cause even life-threatening infections. So there's a long history of antibiotic resistance in Staph aureus. Um, in, penicillin was introduced in like 1943, and within a year, um, staph infections in hospitals were resistant to penicillin. So here we have a timeline. I can only point to one of them, which is a problem. Um, so penicillin resistant staph aureus appears in the mid 1940s, and you can see that a high proportion of, of staff that was circulating, like 20%, within just a few years was resistant to penicillin. Then in the late 1950s, a new class of antibiotics was introduced. Um, methicillin was the first, and they're closely related to penicillin. And within a year, again, there were strains of staph that were resistant to methicillin. And those really took over in the healthcare setting. So the staph infections that people caught in, when they were in hospitals, long-term care facilities, were very often resistant to, to uh, methicillin and related antibiotics. Um, so this shows that staph is just really quick at picking up the, the piece of its uh, genotype that needs to be altered to become resistant to new antibiotics. It, it selects very quickly for it. So then what happened in the 1990s, um, first at, right around 1990, there were some new kinds of MRSA that showed up. So all the way from the 1960s through the 1990s, all of the MRSA infections were ones that were being caught in long-term care facilities, hospitals, among patients with dialysis, people who were weakened, um, who had something that was invading their skin, like a catheter or you know, a, a surgical wound. Um, it, and they were weakened, compromised hosts. They were, they were sick people. That's why they were in the hospital and having surgery. Then a few cases started showing up in cities in the United States, mostly among children, that, that were a mystery because they were children with MRSA who had not been in a hospital, nor had either of the other people in their immediate household. And, and this, was a, this was something new and worrisome. Now the MRSA they showed up with was not as difficult to treat as the, the kind in the hospital, although it was resistant to all of the antibiotics closely related to methicillin, which actually was no longer even manufactured at that point, so the name sort of goes on even though methicillin doesn't, uh, doesn't exist. Um, but they were, they were still susceptible to several widely available kinds of antibiotics that were not terribly expensive. Whereas by that point, the MRSA in the hospitals was resistant to a great many different kinds of antibiotics. So there were this trickling of cases in the 1990s. And then around 2000, as you see here, they took off. And you start to see that kind of exponential increase as a proportion of all staff, right here from 2000 
that, that you see in an epidemic curve. And people started to talk about an epidemic of mercy in the community. Now, recently, that actually appears to have leveled off. And so I think it's not technically right for those of you who've had an epidemiology course to call this an epidemic, which is something that you expect to go down again, but rather that this was a new strain of staph which has become endemic at a very high level in the population, so that about half of the staph circulating, causing infections in the community is now MRSA. So, just to sort of clarify these distinctions, because it gets confusing, and frankly at this point, the community MRSA is showing up in the, in the healthcare environment, and, and so the distinction is getting a little less clear. Now what probably happened in 2000 that caused that big jump is that a new strain, a completely new strain, it wasn't a, a hospital strain that escaped. It was a new strain that had been a very common kind of methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus in the community, acquired a little cassette that made it resistant to antibiotics. Um, it's called USA 300 is the name of the strain, and that's what took, up, uh, took off exponentially. So the, the community MRSA infections, they're usually skin infections, but they can also be invasive and fatal, and even the skin ones sometimes get into people's bloodstream or some other sort of internal um, organ or pneumonia and, and can be fatal. They are rarely um, resistant to many classes of drugs, just a few. Um, and their high-risk groups are different from the hospital ones. Urban children, early, continued high-risk group, IV drug users, people with um, HIV, the household contacts of a case, and you've heard how households are really hotbeds of spreading infection, and that's definitely true for MRSA. But also people detained in jails and prisons, um, soldiers, uh, people in dorms sometimes, and especially athletes, so people who are in close quarters um, with contact. Now this is in contrast to the healthcare, which I don't want to talk about too much, except to say that you know, these, again, were people who were in weakened states, had, had something going on in the hospital which was invading their, their skin. Um, the, 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 the staff itself is a little different, and they had these risk factors that had to do with their healthcare, not with the demographic epidemiologic risk groups that we see for, um, for community MRSA. This is the least gross picture I could find of a skin MRSA infection, but it has these hallmarks, which causes people sometimes to confuse it with a spider bite. Um, it, is the, it, it is warm to the touch. It's painful to the touch. There's a, there's a red area, usually around it, and it has pus. Um, it, it will sort of ooze on its own, or it can be treated. Um, if you go to have it treated, what they will definitely do is get rid of the pus, pack it, put antiseptic on it, cover it, you will likely get antibiotics, but not necessarily, and it's not absolutely essential that you do. Um, and, uh, and those things will help keep it from spreading. So the problem, part of the problem here is that we don't actually see all the MRSA cases. So there's this tiny tip of the iceberg that are these severe, potentially fatal cases, severe se sepsis or bones or you know, pneumonia. Then there are a lot of skin infections that do come into emergency departments, and at this point, the vast majority of skin infections that people go to an emergency department with are caused by MRSA. Um, but there are a lot of skin infections we don't see. People just take care of themselves. And in the great majority of cases, that's fine in that they will get better on their own accord. And then there is this vast group who are colonized with MRSA now instead of the other kinds of staff, and we don't see them at all. And this is really important for figuring out how to <coughs> model it and how to control it because you can catch MRSA colonization from both infected people and from colonized people. So most people had not heard of MRSA until this paper came out in 2007. This was a paper from a group of researchers at CDC, um, and it was picked up by every newspaper, every uh, TV and radio news show, and the basic reason it was is because it had a one sentence horrifying uh, it's a sort of nugget that could, be, that could be explained, which was that in the year, most recent year for which they had data, which was 2005, their estimate based on hospital surveillance of invasive MRSA 
was that more people had died from MRSA than had died from HIV AIDS in that year. So that was the kind of thing you could say in one sentence and really caught everyone's attention. Of course, there was a good news, bad news piece of that which nobody quite took in, which was that the number of AIDS deaths have really been controlled well, but that was not the point. The point was that MRSA, suddenly people heard of MRSA. And we saw that when we did a little study where we used Google Trends, which lets you track over time how many searches there are for different terms. That's that paper. See this peak right here? So here in blue are the weekly searches for MRSA on Google from 2004 through the end of 2008. And you can see that, that article come out. And interestingly, the number of people searching just for staff versus MRSA was tracking really well. This was a, an article in the New England Journal, actually. Um, and then you can see that that article had this true educating the population effect that after that, this, this gap bit opens up and a lot more people are searching for MRSA than for staff. And this is just, these are the hospital um, admissions with a MRSA diagnostic code, just to show this wasn't like there was a big outbreak right then. It really was the news story that caused this. So how to model it, we need to know about MRSA and how it spreads. So it spreads, we believe, almost exclusively by skin-to-skin -skin contact. This makes it a bit different from influenza and other diseases that you may see, because just being close to someone won't do it. You have to really be touching them. There is a possibility that it also um, lasts on surfaces, which are called fomites, so that you pass um, MRSA to some, something you touch, and then if someone else touches it, if, if it has stayed alive on there and someone else touches it, they might pick it up. And that could be part of what explains the athletic facility outbreaks, or those could be skin-to-skin -skin contact. <coughs> For now, and our model is just focusing on that skin-to-skin -skin contact. And then sort of here are some sort of things that we have to have in mind. Colonization is much more common than infections. Um, some colonized persons will go on to develop an infection, but many will not. The, the colonization probably always precedes the infection, although it might be quite transitory. Um, the infections, especially if there's an oozing sore like you saw in that picture, are more likely to spread to other people than the colonization. For most persons, the infections and the colonization will recover on their own if they're not treated, but the colonizations could last for months or years. Some people seem to just permanently stay colonized by staff, and so presumably they could permanently be colonized by MRSA, but we don't have those data. Um, unlike the, the diseases that you've seen so far, where there's this recovered state, We've got the opposite of a recovered state. Someone who's once had a MRSA infection is actually more likely to get another MRSA infection. There is no, um, they, they, have, they have not become immune at all when they have an infection. And after someone's infection resolves, they could still be colonized or the colonization could disappear with the infection, especially if they're given antibiotics might increase the, the likelihood that that happens. So for control measures, and this is what the piece of the model I'm going to be focusing on today, what we need to understand is whether we can focus on the infected or whether we need to figure out a way to control the colonized as well. So the infected, even the infected is going to be a bit of a challenge because only perhaps a half of them come to medical attention currently. So it's hard to do anything about the people you don't see. But the colonized are this vast um, reservoir in the population that have no idea they're colonized and are perfectly fine. So if we had, so these are some of the control measures we might think about and which we would want to test in a model, their relative effect. And what we're hoping now is not really to eradicate MRSA, but to get that endemic level down, to just have fewer people with MRSA infections. So if we want to target the infected, we could be trying to do things that would cause people to seek medical care, more of them to seek it, and to seek it faster. Because once somebody gets the instructions and the care from a doctor, they're going to be infective for a shorter period of time, and hopefully less infective, because they're going to follow instructions about covering the wound and not sharing personal items with people in their household. Um, so that's the equivalent of the mask, the Sarah's mask. Um, and we could also try to decolonize the infected. So there are special measures that are sort of surface things you do to somebody's body to decolonize them, um, which are not ordinarily done, but you could do that. Now, if we need to target the colonized, there are a couple different strategies. In Northern Europe, 
They have had great success keeping community acquired MRSA to very low levels by using a search and destroy approach. And the search and destroy means as soon as you see a case in the clinic, you, uh, you know, something comes to medical attention, you go to that person's household and you test everyone in the household and you decolonize them. So that's the search and destroy. It's, a, it's aimed at colonization but via an infection. The other approach would be to aim at the colonized but not via an index infection. So at this point, so I mean, in theory, you could screen high-risk groups and decolonize them. Um, at this point in the US, there actually are some states that have mandated people coming into hospitals being um, checked for colonization. And you could have an aggressive policy of decolonizing them rather you know, easily uh, embedded on what we're already doing. Or you could do something else, theoretically. So the susceptible infected recovered model that you've heard about doesn't work for MRSA for two reasons. One is there's no recovered phase where you're no longer susceptible. So it's a susceptible infected susceptible model. But it's not even that because we've got this enormous colonized group. So we've chosen to represent it this way. We've got uncolonized, colonized, and infected people. And in order to build our model, we need to have numeric estimates based on data for all of the probabilities for moving from one of these states into another state. So, so for example, what is the probability, A here, of moving from uncolonized to colonized conditional on your encountering <coughs> some number of people over some amount of time who are themselves colonized or infected? Then, what's, once you're colonized, what's the probability that you're going to go on to get an infection? And then there's the, the ones in the opposite direction. An infected person could become uninfected. The, the infection could resolve, but they'd still be colonized or they'd be uncolonized. And the colonization will naturally disappear in some people um, after probably months, and they would become uncolonized. So these are, we need all these parameters to estimate them, to estimate it. Now, this again, this issue of the colonized versus infected, what we're going to be aiming at here is to understand the relative contribution to the spread of, uh, of community MRSA for each case who's colonized and each case who's infected. So in, ef in effect, and this has been, as I said, well set up this morning, we want to estimate the r naught for each colonized individual, how many other individuals will be colonized, and for each infected individual, how many new cases will result from each infected individual. Um, Sarah already talked about this, but just to briefly review, this is a case where there's, there are so many moving parts that we really need to work with agent-based modeling. And the modeling in our project is actually being done at Argonne National Laboratories, which is affiliated with the University of Chicago. It's nearby. Um, and it does indeed require extremely large computing resources to do that. So in the agent-based model, the agents are, are autonomous. They have behaviors. They make decisions. Well, in fact, they're not really thinking little agents. They have rules. And one of the first um, useful models that people put together with agent-based modeling was they discovered that they just had to formulate really simple rules that would, um, based on, about birds, that would allow them to change the direction that they're flying based on what their neighbors were doing, and that they could show how the flocking patterns were successfully modeled with just these really simple rules that the birds had. And that's, I think it's a useful way to think about it. We, each of our agents has rules depending on what's going on around them, their own innate um, propensities to have different behaviors in different situations. And then they organize themselves, they encounter other agents and conditions, and that we see a pattern which we hope emulates what happens in real life. So they have these inter interactions with local information. We don't assume that they interact randomly like the, the SIR model generally does, but rather they have sort of set network patterns. And that there's no central authority. So they're going to follow these rules and apparently self-organize. Now the components that we needed to set up an agent-based model for MRSA um, this was a case, and Gary talked about this. Ideally, you would be able to start with a really simple model and learn something and then add pieces. This is a real struggle that we've had in building a model because it's, uh, there, there are too many complexities in MRSA to start with something really simple. So we're trying to start with the simplest complicated model we can, but it's not that simple. 
Um, we had to move straight into the agent-based model, although we do have one of our uh, the computational modelers in our group who's been working on a differential equations model for, for the, what we call the SCIS, the Susceptible Colonized Infected Susceptible Model. So we wanted a realistic population with demogra realistic demographics. Um, we needed to pick a geographic location where we actually had incidence data for MRSA, which is a rarity. And this is the Gary's comment, too, about you got to study what you can count. And so we needed a place where we had some trustworthy counts. There are no great counts of MRSA for those reasons I showed you, because there's this vast group of colonized and um, people who don't go to a doctor. But we at least wanted a place where, where somebody was tracking the ones who went to a doctor. And that place was going to be Chicago, because we were there. And there had been three different university research groups who had been working on uh, tracking MRSA in Chicago, because it was clearly a problem. And then we needed to figure out a way to realistically represent skin-to-skin -skin contact. So we picked Chicago, which is, it's a great city. So here's my little Chicago plug, <laughs> which you all want to move to and study. <laughs> Here. So our agents. We started with a synthetic population. This is what Sarah had, too, which is based on the census. So we had the census data for Chicago, and we have this, this model of the whole city. Our model has a few extra traits, because we thought they'd be really important for some of the public health um, things we wanted to test, and also because there was economic and racial stratification, which was really apparent for MRSA in Chicago. It was an inner city problem. So our agents have these demographics, age, sex, race, ethnicity, education, English proficiency. Then they have to be in households, because as you've heard, it's really <coughs> important to be able to model the household, because a lot of the a household is a hotbed of contact. And we also need schools, workplaces, and other locations. Now the physical contact, you, the, the article that you are talking about in your journal club this afternoon is the Polymod study. And they also were interested in being able to represent physical contact, although they're talking <coughs> about flu, so they really don't make a big distinction between the physical and the close-to-close -close conversation. We, however, did not have a survey that was specifically about how much, you know, asking people how, who did you have physical contact with, how long were you with them. And so we took a different approach towards using empirical data to figure out that contact network. Instead, what we did is we used some data that, were, that had collected <coughs> what people do over the course of 24 hours. And I'll talk about that on the next slide a bit more. So we move people from place to place based on their demographic characteristics um, realistically. And we, those places we have categorized as places that have low, medium, or high likelihood of having physical contact with other people. And so then our transmission probability is a function of both where the person is, how likely that kind of place is to include physical contact, like for example a daycare center or a gym are very likely to include physical contact. A school might be medium likely and most workplaces are low likelihood. A household is also very likely. And who else and what the disease status is of the other people who are in that place at the same time. So in the household, who, how many people are in colonized, how many infected, as well as how long they're there. Our empirical data, there was a wonderful resource. The Census Bureau has collect, been collecting for the last uh, seven or eight years this, a national probability sample of 10 to 20,000 people a year called the American Time Use Survey, where they, um, they, people write down where they are over 24 hours, who they're with, what they're doing. So, and, and it has all the census demographics because it's really, it's collected by the same people. So it's really set up nicely to be able to link probabilistically by those demographics somebody who has a, a particular time diary for a person. So unlike some models, and this is a case where maybe we've gotten kind of complicated, um, we have a really wide variety of kinds of daily time patterns because we have this realistic data from the whole population. So people are given their time script um, for days of the week, for Saturdays, Sundays, based on linkage, this probabilistic linkage with the time use data. And then, unfortunately, the, the uh, ADIS only collects people 15 and older, so there is a smaller but similar data collection for children from a study out of the University of Michigan, which is also a national probability uh, sample called the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. Now, our biggest challenge was figuring out these transmission parameters, those A, B, C, D, E, 
And what we've done, and here are these tiny numbers that you see are what we're currently working with, are um, transmission parameters per hour. So they're really tiny numbers. And the ones that, and, and they're also conditional on there being colonized and, and infected people and how many there are in the, in the area. But the way we did these was by scouring the literature and also using a study that one of our co-investigators has been um, collecting data on, sort of particular studies that actually had data about one of these. So for example, um, uh, one, one particular study was done in an army base where everybody was tested for colonization when they came into the army into, uh, into training and then they were tracked to see how many of them developed an infection. Now that could be a specially high risk group, but that gives us an estimate for our high risk, high contact places of, of the likelihood of becoming colonized and of getting an infection once colonized. So we have a bunch of different studies we put together to estimate these parameters. We do so though with great uncertainty and actually what we estimated from them were ranges that would be consistent with what we had. And then we used our Chicago data to sort of work around with those ranges to see which, where in the ranges we at this point could get a plausible match for our calibration data which was the actual incidence profile in Chicago. <coughs> this is just to point out that that's sort of using again those um, this, these are how these are related to each other. So this is if you have no con. This is what happens to an uncolonized, colonized, and infected individual if they have no contact with someone with MRSA. And of course, they have no risk of becoming colonized or infected. However, if they are an uncolonized person, they come in contact with a colonized person, we give them a risk, and we give them double the risk if they um, come in contact with an infected person. So there are a couple different relationships built in here to the model. So here, we now have taken a sample of 50,000 people in Chicago and run it for 10 years to be our calibration model. And we've got a reasonable calibration, but we're still working on this. And in fact, we're still analyzing some of the um, data that we have gotten, primary data, to, to hone those transmission parameters. But at least at this point, we do have numbers, counts of in, uh, infected and colonized people that are generally following the pattern that we've seen in the population, which is a steep rise and then kind of a steady state. And so these are the numbers we've seen. And from this model, we can actually use this to average over time and figure out what the R-naughts are for each infected case and each colonized case in this model, which has been calibrated to the incidence data we've observed in Chicago. And what we get is that the R naught, I'll read these top parts in a minute, the R naught for colonization from each colonized case is 2.2, and the R naught from each infected case is 0.7. Now, there are some assumptions here I want you to remember. First of all, we have assumed that every infection is at least briefly um, preceded by colonization. And so we're really focusing on the risk of colonization from each case, not the risk of infection. We're also assuming that once someone is colonized, the likelihood that they will go on to develop an infection is irrespective of how or from whom they acquired the infection. So that's why we're really focusing on the colonization rates. So um, these r naughts are the mean number of colonization from each colonization or each infection. Now, as you've heard, the r naught from the, um, the infections is below 1. That's a very small r naught. And so that in itself would be unlikely to propagate MRSA. The key parameter here is the R naught from colonization, which is over two. And so this points us right away to the fact that the colonizations are going to be really important here for the spread of MRSA, which is quite a public health challenge since no one knows they're colonized and because it's extremely difficult and expensive to go around swabbing people um, and doing all of the, what's a fairly elaborate laboratory procedure to then grow what's colonized and test it. So that's going to be a problem. Now I do want to, in red, in italics, in bold, I've written that these are provisional estimates because this is really our first pass and a, and a few people here may hear me, I hope, present a more mature version of this in a while and they may look different. So don't hold me to these ones, but these are our first ones. So what are the implications um, if, if these are in the ballpark? What are the implications for control measures? 
Well, the number of new colonizations is greater from each colonization than from each infection. And, and why is that? Because what I've told you before is that we made this assumption, and, and this was consulting with a lot of infectious disease uh, MRSA researchers, that the infecteds are twice as likely to spread their infection as the colonized. Well, the reason that nonetheless the great majority of, of colonizations out there are due to colonizations is because both there are so many more colonized people than infected people, and also the colonizations last many, many times longer than the infections. So the colonizations are really important even though your risk of getting colonized from a, a, a single encounter with a colonized person is less than from a single encounter with an infected person. So, um, so the, the policies then seem like they're probably gonna need to aim at the, col at the colonized people um, because if we just reduce the infected, we're not gonna have that much impact on the colonization rate. So our next steps here are going to be first, we do need to do some more work on the calibration, the transmission parameters, make sure our r naughts are correct, make sure we've got the best fit to the Chicago data. So our, our overall strategy here is that we're, we're back casting first, we're, we're, we're creating a model that will emulate what we've observed over the past 10 years, and then we're gonna use that, those parameters, to test things going forward. Although we could also do hypotheticals like, what if we'd done search and destroy in 2004 in Chicago? What difference would it have made? But that is, of course, hypothetical. It would be more interesting to know what would happen if we did it in 2014. So then we can model different control strategies and really quantify, okay, if we did have a public camp, the, the easiest public health campaign to imagine, frankly, is one that just tells people what MRSA is and tells them to go seek care right away and until they get to the doctor to cover it up and not share things with their household members. So you can imagine an easy impact on that. Um, the, the more interesting ones to test are what happens if you then take all those infections and decolonize their household members? Or what happens if you test people once they enter a hospital or a long-term care facility and decolonize those people? And so we hope to have estimates of what those might do to the endemic level, because again, we're not going to eliminate MRSA. We hope to just tamp it down a bit. And finally, this is our research team. So, I mean, we were starting from scratch building this model, and it's a really, um, interdisciplinary group. I'm an epidemiologist. My co-PI here, Charles Makel, is the head of the complex systems group at Argonne National Labs. We have two infectious disease doctors who do research on MRSA. We have a Bayesian statistician who, can, who does the computational modeling, a sociologist who works on networks, software developer and agent-based modeler who works with CHIC. Um, we have a database manager, statistician, a social psychologist, and a graduate student in epidemiology who's our project manager. So I, thank you. Questions? Yes. Um, I have two questions. So the first question is, how is being an epidemiologist like being a library scientist? Because you said. <laughs> oh, you actually read my biography? Yeah, I read your just, biography. Oh, okay. Um, yes. And then, and then the second question is related to your talk. It's um, so, what are the main factors that lead a um, colonization to become an infection or that thing? And you, you were saying this was an inner city problem, so I was wondering if you had any um, ideas about how maybe social factors could lead to um, that issue. Okay. So the library one, one first. Um, there's no great connection, except I'm really good at doing literature searches. Um, I, it, I, I gave a little of that, I, knowing that you are college students and you're all trying to carefully prepare and, and plan your future, I did want you to bear in mind that you really never know what the future will hold. And, and I got where I am almost by running in the opposite direction. So there are chances to make changes in your careers going along. So that, that's all I gave that, that result. Now the next one was the colonization to infection. Yeah, what third? do you think, um, and if that correlates with how you were saying it was an inner city problem, do you think social factors could be what social factors could be contributing to that? Or what yeah, so I mean clearly, and, and all of the outbreaks in, um, in athletic activities, you know, football teams, groups that share locker rooms, that, that athletic thing, and as well as the military, the outbreaks in military bases, all suggest that people that are in situations where they get a lot of bruises and wounds um, are more likely to convert. Um, so clearly having, like in the hospital situation, having some, uh, you know, 
having the integrity of your skin uh, damaged is going to make it more likely that the colonization is going to get into a wound. But there is a lot about that dynamic that is not understood, frankly. So it, it is an active area for research, but not a clear answer. Was there a third one? And that might have to do, I mean, the inner city, this is something we need to, we're, we want to model. I mean, one hypothesis, early on, um, our research group at the University of Chicago, the people at Cook County Hospital both noticed that those early cases of MRSA in Chicago were predominantly from children of families where there was a household member who had been in the Cook County Jail, which is the largest um, single incarceration facility in the country. It's 10,000 people a day. And it really just draws from a set group of zip codes in Chicago and people churn back and forth. Average length of stay is 10 days. Now, at this point, we actually don't think that MRSA is particularly spreading in the jail, but there was a point when that jail could have caused it to just seed it in certain areas in Chicago, and it hasn't, it, it's taken a while for it to break out of those neighborhoods. So at this point, it is less concentrated in the inner city than it was, but it, it could also be, of course, I mean, it's, those are crowded households typically, so that, that issue of the number of people in a household I think is relevant here too. Um, and, and as well as there might be places where there just is a bit more be getting beat up, scratched up, and more, more opportunities for skin infections to take hold. Yes? All right, one more, and then you can talk with her at lunch. How does she do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, no, you. Uh, um, Kelly Drews, Tech. Um, I was wondering, for colonization versus infection, um, is it possible that by taking someone who is colonized and trying to remove the um, MRSA, you could open them up to being colonized by, by a more um, pathogenic strain, which could then let, lead them to become infected, so it might actually be counterproductive? Yeah, so, so there are these strategies that sort of try to uh, have tested decolonizing and then colonizing somebody with something that's relatively benign. So you actually might want people to be colonized with methicillin-sensitive staph aureus if there is somebody who is genetically predisposed to being colonized with staph. So that's a very reasonable question. At the moment, MRSA is, is sort of the worst thing out there in the community that, that's common. So it, it's not an immediate concern. But it's, it's a reasonable way to think and the sort of unintended consequences of all of the interventions. It's, it's a very important way to think. And it's, it's actually the value of uh, agent-based modeling potentially is that you, you can put these conditions um, sort of down the line on behavior or, or consequences of what goes on. So it, it's, it's a useful to keep that in mind. 